The Bloodstream Podcast is brought to you by Takeda. Shire now a part of Takeda. And for that, we say thank you, Takeda. And just before we get into the episode, a couple fast announcements. The latest episode of the Ask the Expert podcast with new host Amy Board is all about global health. You'll also get the latest, uh, the newest episode of Ask the Expert, which is focused on the current health insurance scare of copay accumulator adjustment programs. The name alone is enough to make you crazy. So learn more about copay accumulator adjustment programs with an expert uh, on the podcast hosted by Amy Board, the Ask the Expert podcast. If you haven't already, make sure that you are subscribed to both the Bloodstream and Ask the Expert podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Please do leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you're listening. If you haven't already, they do help others find the podcast. We prefer five stars, but just be honest, that's all we ask. You can find us, of course, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can email us, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. We're going to be announcing a new segment that we're going to be looking for testimonials and questions for from you. So you can email us or you can find us on social to give us one of those. Um, and finally, do share Bloodstream on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, anywhere you can. Share it with a friend. Make a phone call. You know, maybe knock on your neighbor's door and tell them to listen. I don't think that'll be that effective. But if you run out of other ideas, there's one for you. Um, and we do generally just appreciate your support. And with that, let's get to the episode. Hello and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast, episode 33, February 18th, 2019. I'm Patrick James Lynch. And I'm Natalie Lynch. On this episode, the case for CRISPR, the controversial gene editing technology, has a case for support. Or does it? We discuss on today's comment segment. Natalie guides us through an article on tidying up your timeline in our like segment. Jimmy Olga here shares his perspective of overcoming sickle cell disease with, well, sickle cell in today's share segment. And actor and artist Katie Wright Mead joins us to talk about her new film, Sometimes I Think About Dying, which just premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, and what it means to create and perform in a film built around a major mental health struggle. Plus the latest installment of Mama Sue's Netflix Rex and an announcement about a new segment on the Bloodstream podcast. To an announcement, he says. <laughs> an announcement is coming. All that and more coming up on this episode. Welcome to Bloodstream. So before we jump into uh, the, the segments for this episode, a couple things we just wanted to shout out up top. Um, as listeners to the podcast know, we are um, very interested in hemophilia globally and especially in developing countries. It's a big focus for us at Bloodstream and Believe. And there have been two big announcements in the last uh, few weeks that are worth mentioning. First, uh, Roche Genentech has joined the World Federation of Hemophilia's Humanitarian Aid Program. Uh, they have made a commitment that will consist of a donation of emicizumab, the prophylactic treatment for hemophilia A, and funding to deliver the WFH Humanitarian Aid Program's integrated care development training to ensure that local infrastructure and medical expertise are available. Can you tell that I'm reading this directly from the press release? Yeah, are available so to use the donated emicizumab in the most efficient and effective way possible. The donation will provide prophylactic treatment with emicizumab to as many as 1,000 people with hemophilia A in developing countries over the course of five years. Worth recognizing that Roche is joining as a new visionary contributor to the program alongside BioVerative, now a Sanofi company, um, and alongside other contributors, Griffles, CSL Bearing, and GC Pharma. So big announcement, very significant. That's not a long list of people, of companies that contribute to the WFH Humanitarian Aid Program, uh, BioVerative, Sanofi, Griffles, CSL Bearing, GC Pharma, uh, and Sobe. I should not uh, exclude Sobe from that list as well. But again, not a very long list. So it's significant that Roche Genentech has jumped on board, um, providing a thousand people with hemophilia A uh, prophylactic treatment over the course of the next five years. I do want to point out, um, just for context here, according to the 2017 WFH's annual global survey, which surveyed 116 countries, and again, for context, NATO recognizes 193 countries worldwide. This is 116 countries represented. They identified 158,225 people with hemophilia A. Again, for context, I really like context. That's the theme of this little bit. Uh, the world population is a little over 7.5 billion. So if we accept that one in 10,000 births results in hemophilia, that is about 750,000 people that should be walking around with hemophilia. Uh, and 80% of those births would be with hemophilia A. We Four out of five have hemophilia A, one out of five have hemophilia B. So theoretically, there are 600,000 people with hemophilia A worldwide. Um, but the WFH has identified 155, 158,225. So that's the number we're going to use. If we accept that 
of the world doesn't have access to predictable, sustainable care, well, 70% of 158,000 is a little over 100,000 patients, uh, 1,000 1, of which will now be on prophylaxis using this roast donation of emicizumab. So it is about 1% of those who are in the most desperate of circumstances and in the have the greatest need. And I don't point that out to be reductive of this donation. Again, that's not a long list of companies that have contributed. And the only company that's contributed uh, at quite the level of Roshan and Tech here is BioVerative with their factor donation. But I do think it's important that when we talk about a drop in the bucket and how great the needs are, that as exciting as it is anytime there's a new company who's willing to step forward and, and make a big give um, or get involved in a meaningful way, that we just remind ourselves of how far there is to go. So in other words, we really can never be doing too much. Um, which leads me to mention something about the other big announcement uh, that came out in the last couple of weeks. Project SHARE, the factor donation program that has been overseen, established and overseen by Lori Kelly, is now officially a part of Save One Life. So for individuals out there who are wondering what they can do to help, uh, we have talked before about the sponsorship program that the, that Save One Life offers, where for $35 a month, you can sponsor a child and family living with hemophilia in developing countries, or you can make a financial commitment of any kind, whatever you're able to give. But if you do have surplus factor because you've recently changed products, maybe you've changed, uh, maybe you've switched to emicizumab and you're no longer taking a factor product and you have some factor remaining, or your dose has changed significantly because of uh, some weight shift or what whatnot. There's numerous reasons people can wind up with a surplus of factor. You can donate it as an individual directly to save one life, um, which is fantastic. Again, we can never be doing too much, whether as an individual industry or as individuals. And we'll have links to uh, both the, the the press releases about these announcements and to Save One Life's factor donation program in the program notes. Natalie, did you want to add anything to that long numerical monologue that I just gave? Well, I just think a, a, another thing that's interesting um, to, to say, like this donation's great, that they're also providing an educational piece too. And, yes. I, and I think that is really important to all of this. Um, donations great and then also further educating uh, medical staff and patients um, on, on treatments is uh, is a part of the success. That's a great point. Yeah, the funding to support the education and the implementation of emicizumab to these countries is vital. So that that is not uh, that's not to be overlooked. So thank you for pointing that out. And thank you. Thank you to Roche and Genentech for making that big commitment. And to anyone who's listening and wondering what you can do, again, please really do consider that and take some action because we can never be doing too much. Okay, so another uh, topic that is near and dear to us here at Bloodstream and Believe that we'd like to uh, spend a fair amount of time on is mental health and mental unwellness. We have Katie Wright Mead coming up in a little bit who's gonna talk about her movie that is centered around mental health and unwellness, talk about her personal experience with mental health and how that's informed that film and her work. Um, we've covered, we've done deep dives on Ask the Expert. We've had multiple segments here on Bloodstream, but we've been covering it so often and it seems to remain such a high need, more education and information and frankly just conversation to destigmatize mental health that we're going to now have a regular reoccurring segment here on the Bloodstream podcast every month. Um, so each month, based on testimonials and questions from you all, the listeners, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com or find us on social, we're going to have small bite-sized segments that are focused on specific components of mental health and unwellness um, and that leave you with some either skill or a clear call to action, uh, a resource that you can find online. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this is going to become a, a nice valuable piece of what Bloodstream has to offer you all each month. And we're gonna start that next month as part of our Bleeding Disorders Awareness Month Total Bloodstream Package, the Empowering Women series, the new mental health segment. It's very exciting. However, in order to make room for that segment, we first must say goodbye to another segment, which leads us today to having to say goodbye to News in 60 Seconds. So Natalie, one of my favorite parts of recording this podcast with you each month is when it gets time to record our News in 60 Seconds segment, I look over at you and the light behind your eyes slowly goes away and you are quickly overcome by sheer fear and anxiety. How do you feel knowing that today will be the last day there is ever going to be a News in 60 Seconds segment? I feel immense relief. You seem like you were immensely relieved. <laughs> my mental wellness has just increased. 
<laughs> this is the first segment. This is the first mental health segment is getting rid of news in 60 seconds for Natalie. Uh, so, uh, but before we say goodbye to it, we are in fact going to say goodbye to it. Um, do you want to tell our listeners how we're going to do that? Well, we are going to do one last news in 60 seconds, but it is not uh, bleeding disorders related. It's just fun news. Yeah, sort of like our parting shots can be bleeding disorders related or otherwise. This is a news in 60 seconds that leans very heavily into the otherwise category. So, Natalie, shall we? Okay. One last time. Goodbye. News in 60 seconds starts... Now, an Oklahoma City woman has resorted to dog shaming after she caught her pet sneaking out at night begging for hamburgers at a nearby McDonald's. Uh, Expletive-laced Facebook post, Betsy Ray says her dog, Princess, if you see my dog at McDonald's on Shields, quit feeding her fat ass because she doesn't show how to act. She doesn't know how to act and she'd be leaving the house and walking to McDonald's at night. She's not even a stray dog. She's just a gold digging ass bitch that be acting like a stray so people will feel bad for her and feed her burgers. Ray has caught the dog in the act as she drove through McDonald's, photographing and filming the dog taking food from drive through customers. The dog approached, approached Ray's car, but when he, she saw her owner behind the wheel, she moved on to the other cars in search of food. Lakers and Pelicans trade talks went dead earlier this month. The Lakers reportedly dropped out of the talks aimed at uh, acquiring all-star Anthony Davis because the Pelicans' outrageous trade requests. Hours before the deadline, the talks went completely f- flat. Uh, some believe that the New Orleans Pelicans purposely misrepresented their interest in the trade with the Lakers in order to sabotage the team chemistry in return for what they viewed as Lakers' tampering in order to acquire Davis. Dozens of foxes have been saved from a Chinese fur farm and have been given a new home in a Buddhist monastery. That's it? That's all we can know about the foxes? That's all we've got time for? That's it? The foxes, they're at a Buddhist monastery. Spoiler alert, they're doing a lot better than they were. And if you want to read more, the links to that article and all that we talked about in News in 60 Seconds (laughs) will be in the program notes. Goodbye, News in 60 Seconds. Farewell. Now for the episode 33 like segment brought to us by Natalie, the secret to actually enjoying your timeline, the Kanmari, Kanmari, that's how you say it, Kanmari, so the Kanmari timeline. Well, we'll have to start with you explaining that. What is Kanmari and take it away, Natalie? So if you haven't been living under a rock, you've heard about the Netflix uh, new series called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. And that series is hot right now. Everyone's talking about it and introducing it into their lives. Um, Men and women both tidy up. And if you don't, Marie Kondo will show you how. She wrote a book a few years ago. It was a bestseller and it was called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up a Magical Story. And fans began- And if you can make tidying up a magical story, that is that in and of itself is a gift. <laughs> fans began adopting tidying methods to organize their spaces and by extension, their lives. So this article actually um, asks if we can adapt the KonMari method to our closets, to our garages, why not use it to organize our social media? Uh, there is, uh, the, it really target, the article talks about targeted harassment against marginalized communities. Uh, this is nothing new, but with the, the rise in social media, these communities particularly get targeted online and, and, and the difficulties that come with that. But you don't have to be in a minority group to, to know that social media can be a place of, um, anxiety and lead to feelings of less thanness and, and basically what, uh, adopting this KonMari theory of, of tidying up um, to to your online presence, to social media, what it can do for your mental health and just uh, the space that is then created in your mind. Um, so it's, it's reminding us the importance of reclaiming our peace by embracing safe, tidy social media spaces. So how do we do this? The article um, says the KonMari method emphasizes personal feelings as a guide for what should stay or leave by simply asking the question, does this spark joy for you? And uh, the principle becomes a tad bit more difficult when applying it to people. <laughs> As a, instead of a sweater, you can. Does pick Uncle up a... Bob spark joy for me? <laughs> I mean, seeing his, friend Uncle Bob, his continuous, you know, maybe racist posts on Facebook do not spark joy. And while going to a basketball game with him may, you don't necessarily need to see him online every day. So it it uh, the article asks questions: um, Do these people post things that make me feel good, or do they? bring up negative feelings of comparison, jealousy, or resentment? Does the content on their page make me feel motivated to continue doing the work that I do, or does it make me feel negative about my own work? Um, And then are these accounts in line with your current values? Just because they were something you followed a few years ago that 
maybe were in line with what you were doing or your goals then, they might not be relevant now. So kind of going through your social accounts and unfollowing accounts that are no longer serving you, no longer sparking joy. Um, and, and it's an interesting way to take this very popular way to organize your closet and to organize your social media because as much as we're, we can cut down on social media, a lot of us use it for work. Um, a lot of us use it for community that we don't actually have in our physical community. So there are so many positives to social media, but you know we have accumulated a lot of junk too in the process. Yeah, it's 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 an all or nothing approach, which is a, a habit that I tend to have to say like, all right, well, just don't use it, like just or or keep using it the same way, but reduce the amount of time you're spending on it, which is not a bad idea. Sure. But to actually evaluate what it is and it is what you've cur curated it to be right these are all just platforms and they are what you curate curate it to be I mean, i've mentioned this before twitter has and continues to be my favorite social media platform to use and whenever someone would say like i don't understand twitter i don't know how to use twitter the best response that i ever heard is like um if you don't like twitter then oh shoot what was it <laughs> but it's, it's, what, it's how you curated it. But it's how you curated it. it. Yeah. It's what you choose to put into your timeline, which is the same as really all of them now. I mean, all the timelines are kind of similarly oriented that sure. way. Sure. And this article hits on, too, how we have um, feelings of maybe obligation. You know, this person followed me, I should follow them back. Or well, I think I was, in this community, too, like there's a lot of, you know, we do a lot of stuff with chapters all across the U.S., but like do do I personally need to be following, like, I'm not picking on anybody, but like North Dakota's chapter and, and South Carolina's chapter and, you know, these six Ohio chapters? It, probably not, but there is a feeling of obligation because I have personal relationships with people that work at these places. I have professional interactions with all of these places. And, and this article this says you don't have to stop having connections, but does it have to be on your social media? Is this a person that you can write snail mail to, an email to? Is it something that you need to be um, unconsciously, it, it's bringing a consciousness to it really. And, and you know, a, a tidying up, a cleaning up. Do I need this right now in my life? You know, and also doesn't mean that you can't pick it back up at another time if a uh, circumstance then calls right. for it. Right? As you said earlier, like it may maybe it used to serve you and now it's not serving you anymore. That same can go like this account wasn't serving me. Now it is. Now it's not again. And, you know, I have to admit I'm guilt. I years ago and not that many years ago um, my, m when I was traveling a ton, mom had said something about like not knowing something about what I was doing. And I was like, I put it online. It's on Facebook. You know, and at that time, my feeling was there were so many people who I felt obligated to like inform of things. So it was like, OK, I can do it on social media. And then it's like, there's the Check. information. Like, I'm not now going to personally. But that's not necessarily the healthiest way to think about communication, especially with, say, one's own parent. Right. Like, right. that's not really a healthy attitude. But I feel guilty to just feeling as though like everybody's there. And if you want to know, you should be there. Well, and this is all new. Right. So social media has been around. Um, what started in 2004 with Facebook. The so Facebook. With the Facebook. Um, so we're 15 years in. And I think this is the, the point at which etiquette around something starts, mm. where, where it's lived its life and now we are able to make choices about it because we understand it. We understand how it's working, how it's not working for us. So societally, it's time to clean your closet. It's time to clean your timeline. And Marie Kondo uh, has a really popular, very specific. Um, she's a Japanese woman who brings in uh, certain uh, Japanese sensibilities uh, to this organization, to the tidying up. And uh, it, it's quite fascinating. So if you haven't read the book or you haven't seen the show, you don't need those things to apply these principles. But uh, it's it's interesting. It's adorable. And um, yeah, I think that this this principle, the KonMari principle, can uh, can clean up all areas of your life. So links to the, to the article in the program notes, but I also feel like even just this conversation kind of hits on the key points is like evaluating, does this bring you joy? Is this serving you well? Do you need this in order to like have a connection to that thing or is there another way you can have it? Just sure. consciously, mindfully reevaluating the content you're curating for yourself. And another part of the principle that I didn't mention is if something's no longer serving you, uh, 
having gratitude for when and where it did once serve you. So, you know, it was in your life for a reason. This person was in your life or on your timeline for a reason. And just kind right. of recognizing that there's, there's a psychological shedding that that's mm. kind of beautiful. Yeah. 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 Shedding aided by gratitude and like some sense of resolution in some way. All right. Great. Thank you, Natalie. My pleasure. And once again, at that time that we'd like to say thank you to our sponsor. Uh, do you know what sparks joy for me, Patrick? I have a few guesses, but what are you thinking about at the moment? Takeda and their continued sponsorship of the Bloodstream podcast. That's true, because without their sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to do this. No, and for that we say, thank you, Takeda. Takeda. Gotta get used to that. When I was asked to highlight an aspect of my sickle cell experience by the Believe Limited team at the tail end of 2018, I was excessively excited. Most importantly, I was excited about the opportunity to continue my sickle cell advocacy. But selfishly, I was also eager to use this medium as a trial to all the injustices I felt my doctors and nurses had put me through that year. After a brief cooling off period forced on me by the holidays, I've become acutely aware that the only injustice here would have been me writing yet another article on how life sucks living with sickle cell. And it truly does. Generally speaking, life does suck living with sickle cell. Every single day there's an obstacle, a new challenge, something to remind you that although you look normal, you seemingly aren't. It's a painful existence, admittedly, but if you harness the power the disease gives you, you have every opportunity to make it a uniquely special life. Every day you're blessed with the opportunities to learn, overcome, and understand. I know it might seem strange to highlight positives in something that brings so much sadness, but here's my frequently overlooked positive sickle cell experience. The ability to move from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm is success, according to Winston Churchill. In my case, the ability to move from crisis to crisis without loss of hope can also be described as success. I've been very successful at making my weaknesses my strength. I wake up every morning filled to the brim with resilience. Sometimes it seems like there's nothing I can overcome. Living with sickle cell and enduring a revolving door of hospital admissions, ER visits, and many, many pain-stricken nights has ultimately equipped me to confront the myriad of obstacles life loves my way. You're the strongest person I know. Every sickle cell warrior has heard that superlative used to describe them by loved ones. It's almost become a cliche, but the statement is as true as steel. Sickle cell has made me stronger mentally and physically. I've been told I have the body of an 11 year old, but I can assure you my childlike figure wields incomprehensible strength. The silver lining to being in pain from constant tissue and organ deterioration is that your body inevitably adapts. You build tolerance to the pain. At work, I perform at a higher level than my employees and colleagues. At home, despite the pain, I'm alert, active, and present. On a Saturday, you'll find me on the ladder installing another gadget or gizmo. I often wonder how much a part sickle cell has played in my addiction to excellence. Surely, my personality can't be the only culprit. Live healthy or die trying. I spend a good chunk of my time getting my mind and body to a healthy place. It's something I constantly work on. Zig Ziglar's approach to life improvements has been pivotal in my life. People often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. I've come to learn that motivation and inspiration is fleeting and acquiring moments of them is a lifelong pursuit. I draw inspiration from sports, movies, books, and even daily life. I find the inspiration in something as mundane as a caterpillar leaving the safety of its cocoon. I use it all as motivation. I'm always on a mission to build a better me. Mentally, I achieve this by communicating. I'm fortunate enough to have an ear to cry to. Someone is always there when my time gets tough. I never let my mind get stagnant. I'm always changing scenery and stimulating my obangada by learning new things. Physically, I try to do everything by the proverbial book. I eat clean, 
stay away from alcohol, and eliminate or keep my vices to a moderation. Adopting this lifestyle has made me, has had me labeled a square. But with everything I'm fighting, with sickle cell, not adopting this lifestyle is equivalent to friendly fire. Don't get me wrong, sometimes acknowledging the situation sucks is refreshingly comforting. But looking at it through a positive lens, living with sickle cell has been a rocket fuel to all my dreams and aspirations. Although they might become statistically harder to achieve, sickle cell has a tendency to confine its sufferers to a bed. But if you learn how to harness the power in your struggle, I promise you, you'll spend less time in bed and more time achieving your goals. All right, and that is Overcoming Sickle Cell with Sickle Cell from our friend Jimmy Olga here. Natalie, any initial thoughts? Uh, initially, I just said off mic, that's so beautiful. It was articulate and yeah, like I got choked up listening to it. Um, I, I love, I love, I think my favorite part of it was um, <laughs> like that, that baths don't last. Yeah. Like I think we all, think of happiness that way. We think of success that way. If I can just get there mm-hmm. and there's no there, mm-hmm. it's getting there and then getting through another challenge and getting there and getting through another challenge. There's no like sustainable there and you have to shower every day and you have to uh, seek happiness every day. You have to seek motivation every day. And yeah, he just said it in ways I'd never heard it before. It was fresh and Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy's a special guy. Um, And remembering the ability to move from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm and success, that Winston Churchill quote, a great quote. Um, You know, Jimmy, one of the things I appreciate about him is uh, not only is he someone who's also living with an inherited blood disorder, but he's also an entrepreneur. Um, and there's the, the way that those two things interact with each other and the additional obstacles also being additional fuel to go after something that is maybe statistically less probable, um, but is fueled by something that most other people don't necessarily have the benefit of acquiring, um, in their journey is I, I, it resonates and I appreciate his perspective on that. I, I, I just think hearing that too, is people who struggle daily with chronic pain or, uh, a condition flex a muscle that other people don't flex as often. So yeah, it it gives you that extra, almost superpower. So uh, Jimmy has also been a part of powering through our uh, inspirational speaker series that we've done. Um, And there is video from Jimmy's appearance uh, in powering through at NHF's annual meeting 2017. I'm going to put a link to that in the program notes. You can learn more about his incredible personal story, uh, more of his insights and his uh, wonderful witty sense of humor uh, if you check out that link as well. So that'll be in the program notes. And again, as Natalie said, thank you, Jimmy. Now, this month's comment segment comes to us from a story in Medium, The Case for CRISPR Babies. Some families with genetic diseases are finding hope in the controversial technology. So to um, to help explain, and I am by no means an expert, um, but what is CRISPR? You may have heard of it. You may have heard of it in association with genome editing, which it is. Um, this is a definition from the where is this from? This is from the National U.S. National Library of Medicine. Genome editing, also known as gene editing, is a group of technologies that give scientists the ability to change an organism's DNA. Several approaches to genome editing have been developed. A recent one is known as CRISPR. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is short for, here we go, clustered regulatory interspaced short palindromic repeats and CRISPR-associated protein 9. That was impressive. Thank you. The CRISPR-Cas9 system has generated a lot of excitement in the scientific community because it is faster, cheaper, more accurate, and more efficient than other existing genome editing Methods that, according again to the National Library of Medicine here in the U.S., this article in Medium, which was published on uh, February sixth, I believe, uh, beginning of the month, or excuse me, late January, rather, late January. Um, it identifies in November of last year um, a Rubicon 
was crossed when a Chinese researcher created the first, quote, CRISPR babies, infants whose genomes were edited before they were born. There was an outcry to this, and in fact, there was an announcement from the Chinese government that an investigation determined that um, the scientist seriously violated state laws and that he would likely face criminal charges. But at the same time, as this article proposes, uh, for some families with severe genetic disorders, the experiment offered something else, hope. So uh, one really important risk to appreciate here, uh, germline editing that this CRISPR technology falls under um, is, as the article says, like playing with evolution, because not only will that person's genome be affected, but so will their children's and their grandchildren's and their great grandchildren's because this editing of an embryo at the earliest stage of life changes the genes not only for those few preliminary cells, but in all the cells that develop after, including egg and sperm cells. There are some severe moral implications, including the fear of creating designer babies through CRISPR. But there was a poll that the article cites conducted by the Associated Press um, that showed 71% of those polled were in favor of germline editing to prevent a fatal disease. And maybe more surprising, 65% support editing an embryo to prevent non-fatal conditions. The article then, um, it speaks to three different individuals, um, two parents of children with inherited conditions and one young man living with one. Um, there's a mother of a boy with hemophilia, maybe multiple boys with hemophilia, who makes the point that um, if it was available, she definitely would have considered it. Um, talks about the hardships of living with hemophilia, but is quick to add that she would want to make sure first that it's safe and that she knows all the potential side effects. There's a young man living with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, uh, which is a very challenging condition. A uh, 26-year-old, uh, no plans to have children or reproduce because he doesn't want to pass the condition down the family line and says that if CRISPR was possible, approved, legal, and could treat Duchenne's muscular dystrophy in an embryo, that it might be something that he would think about, procreating, that is. And then finally, there's a father of a boy who has a, a genetic condition that's similar to Duchenne, myotubular myopathy, um, but considered almost like a more severe form of Duchenne's, and half the children diagnosed with it don't make it to their second birthday. Interestingly enough, he's the most conservative of those who were cited in this article saying, quote, germline editing is something that those boundaries have not yet been yet been set, and there's reasons why people are very skeptical of it, and it's a very well-regulated area. One of his biggest concerns is pushing the science too far too fast, and he argues that in uh, the case in 1999, an early genome editing trial for a rare liver disease resulted in the death of an 18-year-old boy, and the tragedy halted gene therapy research for over a decade, as many in this community might be aware of. Being somewhat selfish, had better precautions been taken in the 90s, would gene therapy have been developed for my son by now, the man says? Would it have been available when he was born? Um, there's a couple scientists quoted in here that go on to say the technology and the science is moving forward. It will continue to move forward. It is something we have to keep an eye on, but essentially the, the case for whether or not it's going to be around um, is somewhat immaterial. It is going to be around, and we then have to wrestle with these larger moral and ethical questions. So um, fascinating article and totally a couple of things a couple of things strike me there's obviously a wide range of opinions and I'm particularly I'm particularly sympathetic to the the father of the child who has the condition which is quote most severe of the three conditions presented in the article but whose perspective is if we had maybe not rushed science at certain phases of this therapy's development um, perhaps my son would have a better chance today so he doesn't necessarily feel the urgency for things like this to be made available. In fact, his thought is we should take our time and, you know, if this doctor, as the Chinese investigation is suggesting, is escalating and moving things at a pace that are inappropriate and illegal, um, that that is no, the, the, the perceived urgency is no justification for that kind of behavior. At the same time, who's to tell a parent of a child or a young person living with Dufresne's muscular dystrophy, you know, to, to, to wait when they have a condition that is known to be fatal? Um, hemophilia is a bit different because for those of us in developed countries, it generally is not fatal. But for many of these fatal conditions, and obviously the poll that was cited, 71% of people uh, are interested in something like this. Um, it's it's tricky. So like, I don't know. I'm curious to know, like, what, what do you make of all this, Natalie? Well, I think it's important to stay curious. I think it's important for questions to be asked, for dialogues to be had, uh, especially around uh, the more... Um, less developed 
more uh, still in, it's not that it's in theory, like they're, they're working no, on earlier it, in its development, earlier process. in its yeah. development to, to start these conversations, to have these conversations, because we're all coming from different POVs, different religious backgrounds, different life views. Um, and also to make clear what we know and don't know and what we can't know. For example, we can theorize or, or have a general sense, I imagine, of if you're if you're manipulating an embryo at such a stage, it will have an effect on children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. But we don't really know what that looks like because we haven't had generations go by and have been able to observe that over time. So there's also the known unknowns that will not change, and it's important to identify that when you're kind of developing a risk assessment of what 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 is this and what are the risks. There are known unknowns that you just have to be willing to accept if you're going to. Use Move this forward, therapy. Yeah. And, and and that there there can be theories about what may or may not happen, but until enough people have opted in and went through it and essentially have been <laughs> human experiments, yeah. we, we would we won't know. But you know, a lot of times that's how um science progresses. Well, and we talk about that with regard to clinical trials, and we've covered that here on Bloodstream, is that part of clinical trials is the human guinea pig. And that's you know, it's uncomfortable and saying it that way, it sounds real like, oh, but I mean, that that is part of it. I mean, that part of it is at some point, these things go from being tested in mice or dogs or whatever to eventually humans, and then they become available on the market. And then there's still real world experience to be had and time to go by and to see what actually happens. And we won't, we don't know until we know. Yeah. Um, I think for our community, it's important to just, we've talked about this before, we'll talk about it again. We use gene therapy in a colloquial umbrella sort of way. So CRISPR and genome editing and gene splicing, and there's all different forms. And if you speak to any of the representatives from the various companies working on gene therapies for the treatment of hemophilia A or B, they'll be happy to tell you about what their particular gene therapy is and is not, what the risk is, risks associated are and are not. Um, so to your point, Natalie, about staying curious and, and having these conversations, CRISPR is very interesting because this idea of designer babies and the downstream bloodline effect and how far is too far. There's there's really opens up a giant can of worms and it's a whole nother thing. The the discussion that you even brought up in the article of uh, people being for this for fatal conditions right. and then also for non fatal conditions. So how you know does it? Okay, uh, I can't have a brown eyed baby. <laughs> like, Right. You know, like how? <laughs> yeah. What does non-fatal mean? Right. What's the range of non-fatal condition? Like we have to d determine that. And at the end of the day, what role is a government supposed to play? And what role is the role of a medical? It. Right. Exactly. Like who's to be the judge and jury of people's decisions along this? I mean, it gets into some real, it gets into real, some challenging real challenging conversations, areas. but exciting conversations and they should be had. And we hope that this article encourages these. Yes, and for sp again, to land the plane on specific to hemophilia, um, make sure that if you're considering gene therapies, if you're paying attention to the companies who are working on it, get clarity on what those therapies are, ask questions um, and and seek the answers. But um, yeah, I, interesting times we're living in. We're living in the future. We really are. <laughs> So this month's interview guest is our dear friend, Katie Wright Mead. She joined us today to talk about her film that was just in Sundance, Sometimes I Think About Dying. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Katie for 15 years and have watched her grow as an artist, as an actor. And in New York, she gravitated to auditioning for theater projects that oftentimes had a mental health theme um, somehow tied to them. Uh, our friends joked about like, oh, are we going to see another suicide play that Katie's doing? When Katie transitioned out here to Los Angeles, she then uh, directed her energies into producing um, material and projects that had a mental health uh, component to it. She partnered with Seth, Seth Kirshner, who is Benny and Stop the Bleeding, and they produced a uh, a night of interactive theater called Find the Light that was centered around mental health stories. Katie's work uh, as an artist in mental health also intersects with her life and her own mental health struggles. And she also lost siblings to their mental health struggles that resulted in suicide. So Katie is very, very both artistically and personally connected to mental health and how it interacts um, on a professional level and a personal level. So without further ado, here is Katie Wright Mead. 
So Natalie and I are joined by our dear friend, colleague, and artist, Katie Wright Mead. Good morning, Katie. Good Welcome. morning. Thank you for having we me. We just made very nervous to start this off. Good. <laughs> We're only talking about sensitive and personal things today. So I like to start with high anxiety. I find that to be a really... Oh, little... I go there fast. <laughs> oh, good, good. So we're going to get along just fine. Um, you know, it, it might be interesting for people. So people in the who listen to this may know you from uh, Stop the Bleeding, where you play Stacy. Mm -hmm. uh, have also been the art director. Have also been a producer on it over the course of its a million lives. Um, I a mean, writer. Uh, a, oh, a writer. Yeah, writer. Uh, Katie's responsible for a lot of the art that you see uh, from Believe Limited, including that which you see from <laughs> Bloodstream Media. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to baseball. crop my own headshot for this. Episode. You are. Yeah, you got to do your own work <laughs> for your own thing. Um, so the reason we're here talking to you, aside from just enjoying your company, is um, you've had a film that went to Sundance recently, and you don't have to necessarily be involved in entertainment to appreciate what it means to have a film in the Sundance Film Festival. In fact, what were those numbers that you had cited earlier? Uh, 9,443 shorts were submitted to Sundance this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sometimes I Think About Dying was listed as IndieWire's uh, top, top 10, 10. must-see short film. So it's on a list of 10. 10 out of theoretically over 9,400. So congratulations. Woo, That's woo. unbelievable. Thank you. Um, you, you've you been back, what, not even two weeks, right? Not uh, even, oh, have you been it's back It's been a, week? a whirlwind. Yeah, I got back w last Wednesday, so a week, yeah. So um, we're, I'm most interested in talking to you about the, the subject matter of the film and how mm -hmm. you took that and wove it into this narrative piece of entertainment because I believe we're always talking about entertainment to affect change and how mm -hmm. do we take these topics and kind of weave them through in narratives that are um, engaging and compelling, but also truthful to the underlying thing that we're trying to represent. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't help but we haven't also like talked since you've been back from Sundance. So I saw your Instagramming and, and the vlogging and like day after day of stuff, but I'm sure you're probably talked out of this to some degree, but what can you share about just like the totality of the experience of being there? It was a lot more communal and a lot less networky than I expected. It's a lot of artists and filmmakers all in one place. So there's a lot of talking about art and filmmaking. That was really like a nice thing to uh, to visit it for a week. It's living, it was kind of felt very much like camp. Mm. You were among peers and like-minded people um, in this very like foreign land. Um, there's a lot of walking. There was a lot of talking. There's a lot of movie watching. How many things did you see? Uh, I probably averaged two screenings a day. Okay. Um, and I was there for seven days. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of media. It's a lot of media. A particular standout for you for any particular reason? Ooh. Um, I really liked watching another block of short films. It was called um, Program 3, and it was a, another set of short films that screened together. Mm -hmm. And um, there was this one short called Lockdown that I loved that um, is written and directed by Celine Held and Logan George, and they're a married couple and they've made a bunch of films together. But it's just really sweet, intimate um, story about uh, high school relationships hmm. in a very specific environment. I don't want to give too much away for some reason, but- Sure, that's yeah. fair, that's fair. Yeah. You gave the title, people can check it yeah, out. Yeah, Lockdown, they, yeah. If you're interested. Um, you said it was very communal feeling. Was there a sense of like mentor, mentee of people who have been there versus people who were there for the first time? Was that dynamic in play? I think I gravitated more towards the first timers. I think we kind of found each other. Or there are a couple veterans, like people who had been there last year, but there was still that energy of like newness and excitement and a little bit like overwhelmed and I'm happy to be here feeling. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that I found. Like we would like just find each other in corners of the parties and geek out about how cool this was. <laughs> what was the experience of the premiere? What was like how the, the the run up to it, the actual viewing of it, the chatter afterwards? What was that all? There like? was it was a bit of a frenzy of like it was there were 16 of us staying together in one house. So we were all getting ready at the same time. There were two bathrooms and we were just like buzz, 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 buzz. And then we all get into Ubers and we get there and there's the press line and that happened really quick. It's like, you're up. Okay, go. Next, next group picture. Everybody laughs, smile, funny picture. Ah, you're done. And you're like, that's the 
Sundance press line that you're going to see pictures of forever. And it just happened. And then the screening itself, I, I think I just numbed out a bit. I was a little overwhelmed. So I went into like my like happy place. Steph and I, the director, just held hands during the entire screening. We we were kind of in this like, I was in this trance of, whoa, this is this is really real right now. Also, I was sitting by the door and they were letting some people in and out during the screening. So I almost lost my mind at the people letting them in and out. I'm like, yeah. this has been a year of my life. Please yeah. keep that door closed or I will do something. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I, I feel like any screenings of stuff I've made, I'm I, I sit I'm sitting in the back. I want to sit in the back because I, yeah. I want the audience in front of me too, so yeah, I can yeah, see yeah, how yeah, they're yeah. doing. But then you're privy to all the crap that goes on in the back. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. People yeah, coming yeah. in and out. There's a weird sound things, so and it, nobody else notices. No, like I would, not. I I talk to people about it after about like, did, could you tell how many people they let in and out? And they were like, no, no, no. Yeah, zero other people <laughs> yeah. but us, like producer filmmakers who are, are the ones thinking about it. Um, and what about afterwards? I mean, the well, we'll talk more about the, what the film is in a second, but I think the title alone, sometimes I think about dying, kind of gives a, a little bit of a clue yeah. as to what's going on. What was the conversation like afterwards? And I guess I'm also curious how much of the conversation was about the artistry of the film and the story of the film and, the, and then the subject matter itself. Well, it's funny. The conversations about the film, I most of them I had were not right after the screenings because it's still such a like people are going to other screenings and going to parties and it's just such a frenzy, good energy, but like there's not a lot of like stop and sit and talk time. Um, so the good conversations I've had about it actually have been through email, um, one-on-one -on -one with people when they've, after they've seen the screener that I've sent them, it's been, people are, are much more like, they're re the movie's very intimate and I feel like their re responses are very intimate intentionally. So like mm. they want to like set, a, set a aside the time to like connect with me about what they just watched instead of, you know, grab me by the arm after a screening and, and let me know. Yeah. It's not like an action movie where you can just be like, that was great. Yeah. And like move on. Yeah, like yeah. if you're going to talk about it, you yeah. want a different kind of conversation. I mean, I did have like a couple of people I didn't know, like complete strangers literally grab me by the arm and be like, whoa, you clean up really well. <laughs> and like uh, one guy did say very loudly in the lobby of the movie theater that ours was his favorite one. Wow. And I was like, yeah, thank you, inside voice, please. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to become a target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little about the film. Uh, what is sometimes I think about dying about? So it's a movie about a woman who thinks about dying. Huh. And it's a comedy. Huh. <laughs> it's a dark comedy. She thinks she's so bad at living that she escapes in her own mind where it's safe to numb out, which is a word I used about myself earlier, to numb out and escape into this fantasy of herself dying because she finds comfort in the thought of just disappearing and how you can't disappear any more than, than after you die. And so she imagines what that would be like, escaping life ultimately. And I think we've uh, alluded to this. I don't know if I've said it specifically, but in addition to playing that woman, is she named, is she woman? Is that we her name? We named her Fran in the play. Fran. Her uh, in the script, she was called Nameless. Mm. We named her Fran for the film. Okay. So can you talk about that for a minute? You said in the play, mm -hmm. it was a play first, and then you adapted it. Yeah, we. It, what year did we do? Two thousand thirteen. Um, I auditioned for this play for a person I met recommended me to audition. They called me in. I did the thing, got the part, did the play, and it was. Um, it was. It's it's like when you meet someone that you know you're going to be friends with. It, that was that experience. I as soon as I got the sides for the audition, I was like, this writer, yes, I want to work with this person. I want to be a part of of. I want to be in this world. Um, when I started rehearsals, I clicked with the director. I'm like, ooh, I really respect her. She's smarter than me. I want to be in a room with her a lot. And then you know the emotional journey that I took during the rehearsal process was intense. I had just started therapy for the first time in my life. And 
I was just getting out of a very dark place and this character lived in that dark place. So I was so scared and I talked about it in therapy with my therapist. I was so scared of sinking back in there Mm -hmm. because all I wanted to do when I first read the script was hold this character who was so vulnerable and fragile and um, in need of connection. I just wanted to like wrap my arms around her and take care of her. But that's not what acting demands. It doesn't want the the character doesn't want need you to take care of them. It needs you to f- fill their self with yourself. Right. It needs you to be there and go there. So I did, and I was scared. But thank God I was in therapy because uh, I had started acquiring these tools to be able to go to actually in my real life go to those dark places and come out of them. That's really interesting. Yeah, you know, like it makes you wonder like if you had not been in therapy at that time what the experience would I think been like. it would have been a problem. I really do because I've played I've been in um I've played roles that have been very dark and needed to go there pre-therapy and um ooh yeah, I've gone to some dark places and it's taken me a while to come out. There's been like a an emotional hangover after playing these roles. But not with this one. This one felt very much like there was a lot of flow. There was a lot of self-awareness, a lot of releasing. And again, my weekly visits helped with that big mm. time. My therapist actually came and saw the show. She commented on how how much humor I brought to the role, which mm. is something she would always say in my therapy session was like, you're very funny. And that's the first time I felt funny in a very long time was when mm. she told me that because I was in such a dark place at that time. And, and when I read the script... I had that same feeling of this person is so sad, but so delightful and so funny. And I want to, I want to like, that gave me such hope. It's the same hope that I felt when my therapist said that I was funny. It's like, yeah, there is a spark still alive in me. Mm. So what was the process from then? You said 2013. So what was the process from the play goes up, your therapist comes to see it, play goes down. And we're obviously here now in 2019 with a short film built around Fran. What, give us a little insight into the process and why. I'm actually more excited to talk about this than to talk about Sundance because this is like the real journey. You know, Sundance is winning a lottery ticket. That's not the real thing. The real thing is what did happen between 2013 and 2018. And it was five years of, uh, just life and trying, you know, working on different projects and trying out new things and some of them being okay and missing the mark, but flexing my muscles as a producer and a writer and um, moving to LA and meeting new people there. And this, the movie didn't happen until the director, Stephanie, moved to LA um, in 2017. Like she represented that time in my life when I was working on that play that I loved. So I met with her and that's what I wanted to talk about. And I wanted to talk to her about this idea of like making it into a movie maybe. And she was so on board. So we asked Kevin, the playwright, if we could do that. He said yes. And we started just getting at it and writing this adaptation for the screen. And it was so fun. And we had no idea. We didn't even know it was going to be a short film at first. It was like, what are we doing? Is this a feature, a web series? What does it want to be? And it ended up wanting to be, asking so politely, to be a short film. So eight months later, we had a script. And, and you know, into those eight months, we started pre-production. And it was just kind of uh, happening fast, but with intention and using all the things that we'd learned. I'd made another short film that I directed and produced and wrote and raised a lot of money for, too much money for. Uh, I, I I look back on and, and realize like, I didn't need to have raised that much money. I could have been more um, savvy about how I spent it. Something that, that's something that I brought into this film. Hmm. I was much more respectful of the money that I raised and smarter about asking for favors and not being so, um, yeah, not being so scared to ask for help. Hmm. So that's a great thing to one realize and acknowledge and then two to be able to like comfortably say out loud. Yeah, that was definitely um, a big priority for me. And that that this film is a culmination of all the work you did before it. it yeah. This film couldn't have happened without that other film, oh, without yeah. all the other flexing and, uh, you know, trying something on and it not being the right fit. You know, and yeah, I mean, if it weren't for that other film, I wouldn't have asked for nearly as much free stuff as I did for this one. Mm -hmm. And that free stuff made it so we could 
how I, how's our crew? I mean, Believe contributed uh, resources out the wazoo for this film. And it takes I- Takes a village. Yeah, it takes a village. So yeah, that and also all the theater training I had for me to nail the audition, you know? I, it's like, I wouldn't have been able to get that that role in the play if I hadn't been, had dozens of terrible auditions that taught me to prepare for an audition as though I had the role. And it just goes back and back and back. Like everything adds up into itself. When you and Stephanie started working on the script, not knowing, like you said, is it going to be a web series? Is this a feature? Oh, it wants to be a short. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about the why, you know, why in 2013 did the character and the material feel like someone you were going to be friends with? Why did in 2017, why was it something that was still obviously living presently with you um, and needed to become something like why, what is in the material that just compelled you? Because you have had other opportunities. You've been involved in other projects and we both know how, you know, a, a component of one project can spiral out to become its own thing you want to work on. But so often, you know, you do it and you have your takeaways. Oh, I didn't need to spend all that money. And you move on to the next thing and it comes with you in your experience. But this material stayed with you for a long time. Yeah. Why? Um, definitely because of my own journey and struggle with mental health and it find and this project and I found each other at a time when I could actually it, it it could reach me in a way that I could really absorb um because of all the work I had been doing so it really it really sunk in at the time that I was working on it and that is like you know it's like meeting the like a, a soulmate a friend soulmate that just doesn't go away so when stephanie came back into my life in 2017 when she moved to la it was like all of those feelings came back of uh of excitement and passion and um you know when a good friend comes to visit you you just are like oh there hasn't been a day that's gone by I, I immediately felt like we could speak the same creative language to each other when we sat down at coffee. And that was a huge component is a, is how much, how quickly and easily we synced up as artists. We just sort of spoke the same language and we were interested in the same things. Her dad is a um, psychiatrist and she's just like super tuned in and smart about the human psyche. And that really inspires me about, you know, us being able to um, talk about the work in that in that really specific way. So the enthusiasm that she brought to the project has always been a huge motivator for me because if she's going to work this hard, then I'm going to work this hard. And if she's going to put in her smarts this much, then I'm going to put in my smarts this much. So it's this constant game of, you know, matching each other's enthusiasm and neither of us has ever really dropped the ball. So it's kind of been easy to keep the momentum going, which keeps the product productivity high. But yeah, I, it's, it's a combination of the two things. It's the material itself has always struck me as very personal and important. And then the relationship with Stephanie, my co-creator has been inspired and motivated. And how, how did your connection to the material and to that character and to her fundamental structure, uh, struggle, shift between 2013 and 2017, 18, as you were saying earlier, you moved to LA, you got married, you had a child, you've mm. you just like aged and have more life behind you. How did your experience of being Fran change as a result of all that? That's so funny. That was actually a concern of mine. When I, when we started working on this, I thought to myself, Ooh, am I damaged enough to play this role now? <laughs> Have I like- Have I gotten too healthy? Yeah. <laughs> and I was really concerned about that. And I think, can I swear on this show? Yeah, sure. We can, you know, whatever. Uh, we can bleep I, things out. Go ahead. Say what I you want to say. Okay. Well, that's like, you don't have to be broken and damaged to explore those parts of yourself. It's a practice in empathy. You don't have to be, you don't have to be at your lowest to connect with someone who, who is. And that's what I realized with Fran this time around is I was, I had my, ba I mean, granted, I was sleep deprived and had issues at the time of sure. filming. <laughs> I still have issues. Let me be clear. <laughs> but my cup was full and I was full of joy and gratitude and so happy to be, I was empowered, so happy to be working on this project. 
but it didn't mean I couldn't tap into my empathy for Fran. Did that feel different though in, from 2013? Yeah, it did. It didn't feel so all consuming. I could go home at night and really turn it off. I didn't have to like work through, work my way out of it. Mm. Um, and it also has to do the difference between theater and film. Theater for an actor is much more consuming than film is. You have to work for, for, for film acting. I really have to focus to get there and then I can get out of it much easier. I don't know if that's true for everyone else, but it's just not a, the, it's just, you don't have the floor as much. So you, it's, it's a little bit harder to take up as much space, mm. um, which works for this film because it's such a small character. You're not having to revisit the same things too every day, day after day yeah. for the length of the run. You kind of focus, you get there, mm -hmm. you do it as many times as you need to, and then you move on from that. Place. Yeah, and when you, especially when you're so involved with production, like the way I was, I um I knew, oh, this take is a wide shot where I'm just gonna scoop some cottage cheese onto the mushroom burger and then we're gonna cut. So like, yes, I'm in a very deep emotional, Fran is in a very deep, a deep emotional place in that moment. But does Katie really have to go there? Cause I know what that, I know what the shot is. Right. And, and so it's this, um, you kind of have to like, uh, play this game of how far do I go and when, mm -hmm. when do I access the real like nitty gritty stuff? And when do I just kind of like, just allude to it? Yep. Because that's the job doesn't always require really going there. You can't get away with that in theater. There is also a, there's a nuance to what you're saying too, because yeah, if it's the cottage cheese on the egg and it's going to be my wrists and hands in the shot, like mm -hmm. I don't really need to be like living in the depths of the emotional pain at that particular moment mm -hmm. perhaps. But if it's a wide shot and there's a little bit of action, something that James Gandolfini just did incredibly well. And because I do what I do, I pay attention to this kind of stuff. He's still living in it. Like yes. he's still living in the reality of that character, even when the camera's far away, even when the shot's far away, even when it's just he parks, he gets out of the car and he walks in the door. There's an experience. He's got a secret. Yes. He's coming from somewhere. There's a thought process and we'll never know what it is, but it's why I'm watching him just walk for no particular yes. reason. So it's a it's the nuances of learning as you go, learning what yeah. the different shots are, learning yeah. what is called of you when, yes. you know, and and protecting yourself too. Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Cause you can burn out really fast as an actor on set on a 12 hour work day. And yeah, and James Gandolfini in those wide shots, he was doing his job. He's tracking his character, tracking his character arc. He's not dropping the ball, but did he actually like, did he actually tap into the ugliest of ugly in James Gandolfini in that shot? Probably not. He was, but he was carrying the, he was carrying the torch from one scene to the other. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, so just a, another question or two about the the film itself. Um, you know, when people have asked, so full disclosure, I'm, I'm an executive producer on it. So when people, when it does come up and I talk about it, um, I reference how there's a, a, a real psychological, emotional struggle that is depicted in this narrative. And as I was saying at the beginning, the, the kind of believe umbrella of entertainment to affect change. And it is a piece of entertainment, but there is there is a real mental health struggle that is going on within this character. Mm. Um, do you do you have any, I don't want to overlay this onto you. So no. putting this in the form of a question, do you have any hopes? Tell me what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> do you, Here's your script. <laughs> do you have hopes for how this film could affect a change around mental health or, or reach people who mm. relate to the struggles of it beyond the entertainment value of it? I guess, is there is there any hope or aspiration that you or Stephanie or those involved have for how it may connect to people who relate to the experience they're watching either yeah. because they have had it, have it, or a loved one does? Yeah, I mean, I think that this movie is, has been from the response I've gotten and it's the response that I've wanted is incredibly validating for anybody who's feeling alone, who's feeling disconnected to the world around them and scared to reach out. Cause that's what this, that's what her story is about is a woman who, you know, I know I, I kind of painted a quick synopsis of she's afraid of living, but really what she's afraid of is human connection. That's what she's afraid of, but that's what she wants too. That's what every human wants is we're always craving that human connection. And that's clear in the film. Yeah, so it's this push and pull of of the thing she's afraid of is the thing that she wants. W what does that do when you connect with somebody when you're in a dark place is that it opens up all the doors and she's just so afraid of all of that stuff flying out of her. 
Because if you lock it in yourself, if you lock it up in yourself, at least you're not spoiling the beauty around you. But once you connect with someone, it it wants to fly out. You just want to melt into them and you could destroy the most beautiful thing, the thing that's closest to you. If you get all that gook on them, all that emotional gook, I think that's the biggest fear that she has is getting all of her emotional gook on the world around her mm. and the people around her. Um, so anyway, what, what do I hope people get from this movie is that, um, that they're a little less afraid of that, mm. that opening up is actually, um, that that's your own, that, 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 that is your own narrative that, and that the person that is with you actually wants for that. They want to get a little dirty because they love you. It took a long time for me to say the word depression. Mm. I, it took a long time for me to think that was the word for the thing that I was maybe experiencing. And then it took a long time for me to say it. And then it took a long time for me to like truly do something about it. Yeah. And there's there's a resistance to, I think in addition to, I, I resonate with the uh, uh, emotional gook. I don't want to spoil the world around me. But then there's also the, if I say it, then maybe it's true. And then I'm putting it out there and then I'm identified as this thing. Yeah. But the reality is part of depression. And I don't know if we would say that Fran has depression and we don't need to get into like the clinical diagnosis of Fran, but there's distorted thoughts and there's distorted feelings. And what happens is when they are internalized, it just feeds on itself. It's not bouncing against anything. There's one great scene where we watch Fran in her internal monologue go through this tremendous journey. But the person that she's in the scene with, like nothing has changed for that individual. And it's just a very confusing situation for that individual. But we're allowed to experience her- her Perceived reality. To put, her yeah. perceived reality, which feels real. Yeah. And until the words come out and until you're connecting with another human and getting feedback, it's just all what's going on internal internally. And that's so damaging. And I felt like that was that was a piece of the film. And that scene in particular, it was like, that is perfect. Like that is exactly what that experience yeah. is. Yeah. Totally. And it's funny, you say you say it took you a long time to even say the word depression and then label yourself as someone who deals with depression. And I think I kind of just like raced through the fact that I was in therapy during this process, but that was huge to show up for therapy. That first day, I was shaking. I was, I couldn't even speak. My Ryan, my husband came with me and sat in my first therapy session just to be there with me and to help me like try it out. Yeah. It was like a try. I wouldn't even admit that I was going. And I, I was just so scared of bursting, of like getting all of, again, like getting all of this gook out of me and making it real. Once once those thoughts are out of your head, you think, oh my God, they're going to take over the world. They're going <laughs> to, they're so powerful. And it's the complete opposite. Right. Once they're out of your head, they kind of just like deflate. <sighs> yeah. Maybe as a kind of concluding subject, I do want to spend just a couple more minutes um, talking about, again, the Sundance experience, but not so, well, it's not really the Sundance experience so much as women in filmmaking. I know that they're, you know, you and Steph, uh, the editor, Stephanie as well, mm -hmm. uh, producer Jessica Lauren mm -hmm. Richmond. Um, we've talked about the playwright, Kevin Armento. Kevin is a male, but that's mm -hmm. okay. We were, we're okay <laughs> with that. But this is a this was a female-led project. Mm -hmm. um, and that feels significant. I mean, it's significant in general, but right now, c culturally, that feels particularly significant. And I'd just be curious to kind of hear from you, how much does that element does that resonate with you? Is that something you're particularly proud of? Is it, I don't mean this reductively, but is it just mm -hmm. sort of a byproduct of like, oh, I like working with Steph. I like working with Steph. I like working with Jess. And we're just, we're ladies. Or was that yeah. more, was it more conscious than that? No, it wasn't more conscious than that. It was really a byproduct. Um, the, the, having the women on uh, that crewed up the film was, it was all the talented people that we wanted to work with. Um, but yeah, like you said, Kevin is a male playwright and this is, Fran is his character. Um, you know, we put her in the, in, in the world of film and that took a lot of, uh, finagling, but, uh, it is his character. He wrote a, a female, like a very fleshed out female role and the DP is a male and he, um, you know, every, every shot you see is so beautiful and sensitive and poetic. Um, and yeah, and the women that worked on this also brought like the best of themselves and everybody yeah, everybody was literally the best person for the job and it just worked out that there were a lot of women. And now the question that uh, you might be sick of getting asked and I know I, I hear it enough and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, check back later. Um, so 
Where can people see it? What happens oh, yeah. next? What? Where do we go from here? So let's let's hear the response where, to that. <laughs> Our lawyers are reading over contracts because we have gotten a couple offers for distribution, but we really don't want um, uh, an. Ex- we want to make sure we read about the exclusivity clauses in them because what's really important to both Steph and I, both um, for our careers and also just to get the story out there is that everybody can see it and they're not paying for it because it's a 12 minute film. You're not making those to make money. You're making them to make uh, calling cards for yourself as an artist. And also, and also for me, because of the, um, the topic of this film is for people to watch it and be affected by it be given permission to like let out the ugly let it dissipate you know um natalie any final thoughts from you or final questions from you i don't know a person who'd watch that film and not see a little bit of fran in themselves so i think it it was masterfully done and really beautiful so thank thank you for birthing it into the world Ooh, I like that. She's a doula. She does that stuff. <laughs> She's a doula. I'm a mom. Also, Natalie was my doula. Can I mean, we there's, a lot of, there's a lot of inside baseball going on. <laughs> a lot of inside baseball. I realized I didn't give a link to anything because yeah. we don't have it, but I do. we do have an Instagram handle, and that is where we will announce any release of the film. Okay. So you sometimes I think about dying, or what's the yeah, handle? Yeah, it's at sometimes underscore think underscore. No. Shoot, you're going to put this in the text. <laughs> it's going to be in the program. It's, no, it's sometimes in- I think about movie, all the words have an underscore in between them. Perfect. Sometimes I think about movie split by underscores. Yeah, and we'll have yeah, links yeah. in the program notes as well. And when there's updates, we'll also make an announcement oh, here cool. and share it to yeah. Bloodstream as well now that we've introduced the audience to it. So thanks for coming on and th- congratulations. Sharing your radical vulnerability with us. Uh, <laughs> all the time, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Katie. Grab that mic. You were excited. Natalie gets excited anytime it's time to do our sponsor shout out. It's one of your favorite parts of the podcast, I think. It's one of the parts that doesn't give me agita. All right. Well, go ahead. Take it away. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) You knew that was going to do that. I didn't prepare anything. But okay. Um, So Takeda is, well, Shire... Takeda really Shire. Well so far. Shire's Takeda. Now is now. now is now a part of Takeda. Is now a part of formally Takeda. Formally speaking. So just in case someone didn't know, you know, like we're just making we're making that assumption, but we're here to educate and empower. Yes. So in case you didn't know, Shire is now Takeda. Is now and a part of Takeda. Is now okay. It, it didn't me, just change its name. It was acquired by another company called Takeda and it is now, and a, now part it is a part of Takeda. Assistant to the regional manager. Inside joke. I liked it. Thank you. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you. And thank me. And mostly thank <laughs> Takeda. <laughs> Thanks, Takeda. Thank you for sponsoring this podcast. I promise we take it seriously. And now for our second installment of Mama Sue's Netflix Rex, my conversation with my mom, Sue, about what she's watching online. All right. And back now for our second installment of Mama Sue's Netflix Rex. We got none other than Mama Sue Lynch. Hi, Mom. Hello there. So I uh, mentioned this to you off mic, but you know you got some uh, you got some good praise from your your first segment last week. People liked your movie uh, or your TV show reviews. Oh, good, good. Well, I'm just a regular person, so I'm glad that they appreciated it. <laughs> I think that's exactly what they appreciated. Um, so we had a, a great start last week. What are the uh, the three that you've got this week? Where do you want to start this week or this month? I should be saying. Um, I watched Downton Abbey. I thought it was amazing. You know, um, it was it was back in 2010 to 2015. It was six episodes. That means six years. And back then, I didn't have a smart TV. Six episodes or six seasons? Six seasons, probably 10 episodes okay. per season. Um, it starts at the turn of the last century um, on one of these biggest states in England. And these estates are starting to lose a lot of money and things are changing in England so you come in when, when it's beginning to change and you have Robert and his American wife, Cora, and their three daughters and Robert's mother, who is played by Maggie Smith, who is fantastic. Um, and you just see how removed they are as much as they love their servants and their servants love them, the two different lifestyles. And as the seasons evolve, you see that 
that they do change and they do loosen up. And, and I have to say with Downton Abbey, I was right there in Victorian England and I was actually disoriented when I would turn off the TV. I was like, wait a minute, it's 2019. It was just, I can't recommend it enough. It was the best thing I've seen in my life. What do you think? I'm sure there's a lot that goes into what makes it as incredible as you're saying. If there was one thing you had to point out, whether it's, you know, the the characters, the acting, the music, the writing, the the cinematography and the visuals, what is it about this show that for you makes it the best thing you've ever seen? If you had to distill it to one thing. Well, at the end of the series, there was something I didn't even expect. They had the historical advisor that was on set throughout, and he had an hour show and he explained about the customs and the etiquette and the, the gossip of the time and why the table was set this way and why the servants were treated this way. And it was so on the, on the money of, of the era. So I just think everyone should give it a chance, one or two episodes, and you'll be hooked, men and women alike. I'm going to watch at least season one by the time we next talk so that we can, we can dissect the show together off mic. Okay, great. Um, so now let's move to something that actually, you know, Natalie would be the more appropriate person to talk to you about this next show that you've been watching. But let's talk about the next one on your list, The Nine Months That Made You. What is that all about? That's from Netflix. Um, and it starts at the beginning of conception, like day one, and it goes through all nine months. And of course, all these years in, in recent years, we've been able to say, well, this happens in the first trimester. This happens in the second trimester. The science is so advanced now, they can actually say, well, at two weeks and one day, the heart begins to beat. And at five weeks and three days, the central nervous system is developing. And the footage they have, and they also show examples of what happens when things go wrong. Like what? Well, like they they um, touch upon albinoism, why that happens. And um, actually what they do mention, and I know you and I are both left-handed, at 38 days, your handedness is set, whether you're going to be left-handed or right-handed. And actually, left-handedness is an aberration. Right-handed is, is the norm. 90% of the population have right-handedness. But um, what the documentary said is the reason it hasn't been weaned out by natural selection is because left-handed people are very good at, at building and at using tools and in sports. And you said that one's on Netflix. I think it was produced once upon a time by PBS, but it's now available on Netflix. Yes, and I really recommend it. And it talks about um, also why some people might be prone to high-risk behavior. At different times during the gestation, there's bursts of testosterone that are let go, and that some, mostly men, might get too much. That's why they go into, you know, jumping out of planes or that they profiled one man that surfs these monster waves. Just all kinds of interesting things. You don't have to be a scientist or a medical person to appreciate it. Just really how a perfect birth is is truly a miracle. That things don't go wrong more often right. is amazing. As you said in the beginning, you know, we've known things like during the first trimester, this happens. Or we know things like, you know, somebody who is the, um, the, the, the son of, say, an alcoholic or an addict is more prone, you know, genetically to be that way. But you never really hear why. And it sounds like this starts to get into some of the science, things such as, well, if you get more testosterone released into your system at these critical stages of development, you're going to therefore show more tendency toward high-risk behavior. It kind of helps explain some of the things that collo colloquially and observationally, maybe we've understood but never knew why. But now moving from the health world and back into the world of crime, you got a little bit of a theme coming through in your third choice here. What's the third thing you want to talk about this month? Uh, the making of the mob, the mob Chicago. But um, it was along the same lines, very clear with the years and what was going on. And it was all about Al Capone's rise. And um, a lot of it is they want, Al wanted to move into the north side of Chicago where the Irish mob was. So that takes up a lot of time also. But it's definitely worth watching if you're interested in that stuff. I am interested. But... Um, I preferred my New York my New York mob show better. Okay, well, fair enough. So for anyone who's uh, on the same kind of crime trajectory as uh, Mama Sue, we've got the the making of the mob, New York, Chicago. I think that's it, right? I don't think there's another. I don't know of any. Yeah, those one. two were the main ones, I think. Okay, and then uh, what's that one on? Do you remember? Oh, that one is on you... um, Amazon. On Amazon. Okay, so we have that on Amazon. And that's uh, nine months that made you was Netflix, and Downton Abbey was Amazon. Okay, so I'm calling it Netflix Rex, but maybe I got to call it Amazon's streamable something. I'll we'll have to rework the title a little bit. 
Um, I know I got to let you go here in just a moment, but what about, I want to hear, uh, you went to see the, the legendary iconic, and I have a feeling you will be quick to point out, rather old, Cher this past weekend. How was it to see Cher perform live? It was amazing. And I have to tell you, I was not even that excited about going because I was like, you know, in recent years, I don't really know what she's doing. And, and then I said, no, I'm going to go. It was fabulous. It was sold out. The, there's three women that play Cher. And I don't know if you would remember Patrick because it was before your time, but she had a very specific throaty singing voice and she still does. And if you closed your eyes and you were hearing these shares sing, you would think it was Cher up there. It was just the best. I was crying. Like when Sunny and Cher were singing, I've got you, babe. I was like, why am I crying? I'm an emotional wreck right now. But I really, I don't know. It was just such a great show and a feel good show. And I highly recommend it, especially to people my age and older, because we all watched the show in the seventies. How did Sonny, uh, he had a, he had a premature death, didn't he? He skied into a tree, I believe in, in Utah. Yeah, and you know they stayed close forever, and it's and they they touch upon it in the show. She was very upset and spoke at his funeral, even though they mm. broke up. They always loved each other, and he did make her. He was the man behind her, and she doesn't she doesn't say he wasn't. You know, so I highly recommend it. It's a great show. All right, and is there anything that you know that you have coming up that we might hear about on the next episode, or uh, not yet? Well, I do have a couple that I'm going to be be watching. Well, I did watch. Um, already, but I'm not going to talk about it now. I watched Conversations with a Killer, Ted Bundy. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, And um, I also watched one on Prohibition narrated by Ken Burns, which was very informative. Mm, ties into your mob interests. Yes. So <laughs> um, that's it right now. And we'll see what I watch besides that. All right. Well, thanks for coming back to doing a, a second installment here of Mama Sue's Netflix Rex. And we'll tune in uh, next month to find out what else you got streaming on the TV. Okay. Very good. Talk to you then. And now to our last segment, Parting Shots. Parting Shots. And this is your favorite part, right? It's one last thing to leave the audience with, bleeding disorders related. Or otherwise. And what is your parting shot for February? Uh, well, since the last podcast was recorded, I started individual therapy. You did. And how is that going? Four, ses- four sessions in, and I can't speak. Um, four sessions in, and I always feel like getting a therapist. I've been in therapy before getting a new therapist, kind of like going on a first date. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the butterflies. Mm -hmm. Am I going to like him? Mm -hmm. Is he going to like me? Mm -hmm. Are we going to be a good match? Is this going to be a forever thing? Are you guys going to be a forever thing? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And it was a great first date that then turned into four. And I have a really good match and I'm really excited to be doing this work right now. And, you know, we're starting the mental health uh, segment coming up that will be a reoccurring segment. And I just wanted to tell our audience that I'm uh, I'm doing my work. Good. That's that's it's good for you. And it's that's a nice, generous thing that you're willing to share with other people through the through the microphone. So, (laughs) And what's your parting shot? Well, my parting shot is that, um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to do a lot of drawing and sketching and um, I was considering a visual arts high school in Manhattan and I actually like wanted to apply and I called them when I was like 12 and um, they basically were like, you can't come, you live in Long Island, you can't come here. And I was like, oh, okay. So then I went to an all boys Catholic high school and had a very different high school experience. Um, And I've gotten away from visual art and I do not, I am not a visual artist, but I always really enjoyed sketching and something actually my grandmother gave to me. She would not consider herself a visual artist either, but when I would be in a lot of pain as a kid um, with bleeds to keep me still and keep me sitting down, she would sketch my figurines and my like wrestling figurines, my Star Wars figurines, and she would just methodically like take time and do it. And I was just, I thought it was amazing that you could do that. And I would get all these like books on how to draw and um, and I just started getting really interested in like what a pencil could do. Um, so I, I have not, I didn't do anything for forever. And then last year, a year or two ago, like I started doing just a couple things and, uh, I just picked something up this month that I've been working on and kind of working on it really meticulously. And I get scared every time I'm moving on to a new section. Cause like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't really have a technique. I don't really know how to capture things. And like, it's just all sort of like looking at it and trying to figure it out. 
Um, but I'm really enjoying it. It's taking a lot of time and it also doesn't necessarily, like no one's, it's not deliverable, you know, it's not a work thing. So it's a hobby. I have a hobby. I've taken up a hobby, um, for the first time in a long, like, I think for real though, it's like the, my first hobby in a long time. That's yeah. like not in some way, shape or form, like intended to be some grandiose project or something. It's for you. So yeah, uh, I've been doing that and that's been good for my mental health and giving me something nice to to kind of come to and it's very meditative. So, uh, yeah, I would encourage anybody who's looking to pick up a hobby, you know, maybe, maybe pick up a pencil. And that is all for this episode. Special thanks to everyone at Believe Limited, the National Hemophilia Foundation, Entertainment to Effect Change, the Hemophilia Alliance, and our sponsor, Takeda. Thanks as well to Jimmy Olga here for contributing this month's share segment, as well as uh, thanks to Katie Wright Mead for being our interview guest, and to my mom for participating in Mama Sue's Netflix Rex. Subscribe to the Bloodstream Podcast, the Ask the Expert Podcast, the Powering Through Podcast, and the Bloodline, special series of podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're there too. You can email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. Want to tell us something you want to hear us talk about in the new mental health segment? Mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You'll also find us on bloodstream uh, on facebook.com backslash bloodstream media and on Twitter at bloodstream info. We're also on Instagram at bloodstream something or other. I think it's info, but just look up bloodstream. You'll find us. Reminder to check out the program notes for this episode in your podcast player of choice or on bloodstreampod.com for links and additional information about the various stories featured on this episode. My name is Patrick James Lynch. And I'm Natalie Lynch. And on Until next time, take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody.